my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. William Kavanagh, who is the director of the Center for World Catholicism and International Theology, and the professor of Catholic Studies at DePaul University of Chicago. Bill's areas of specialization are in political theology, economic ethics, and ecclesiology, and he has written and published widely in these areas. This week he's been participating in a Gerardian conference at ACU on violence and religion. And we're pleased to be able, that he's able to join us this morning. His most recent book is Fear Hospital, the Church's Engagement with the Wound Wounded World. Would you please welcome Dr. Bill Carroll. Thank you, John. introduction. Thanks to Lucy and Carrie Ann and everybody else who's made this conference possible and uh, offered me the invitation. It's really nice to be back in Melbourne. I was here 10 years ago to do a series of lectures and brought my whole family and my wife and three boys uh, were eight, six, and three at the time, and uh, which made for an interesting plane ride over. <laughs> and, um, and so very fond of us. We stayed in the old Simmons Hall, actually. And uh, have very fond memories of playing in the park and eating lamingtons and eating a little bit of wombat. And so it was great. Yeah. So it's really nice to be back now. Everybody's complaining about the weather, but uh, I've spent the last 20 years in Minnesota and Chicago. And people complain about the weather here. I'm tempted to paraphrase Crocodile Dundee and say, that's not a real winter. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. So when people try to locate the source of Pope Francis's appeal in this secular age, I think of the photographs of Francis embracing a man named Benicio Riva who's afflicted with neuro neurofibromatosis, a severely disfiguring disease. Riva, who's used to being shunned, said he was shocked by the Pope's lack of hesitation. He, well, the Pope went right for Riva at an audience at St. Peter's School, where he raised him tightly for a long minute and kissed him. Uh, Pope Francis did not really wave his hand at him in a gesture of blessing, but he pressed his face right up against Riva's, and no words were exchanged. Only weeks later did Riva speak about the moment, saying, I feel stronger and happier. I feel I can move ahead because the Lord is protecting me. And Pope Francis, as far as I know, has never spoken about the moment, uh, in part because such encounters are common for him, in part because no words are necessary. So, what does such a photo say to us as educators? Uh, certainly that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? I'm going to talk 50 minutes, 45 minutes, and nothing I will say will stick with you like this uh, photo will. But the power of images has been cheapened in an environment in which we and our students are constantly bombarded with images. The news service webpage from which I took this photo um, had right next to it a picture of Britney Spears in a bikini um, and a story about her newly fit body and so on. So all these images just kind of get jumbled together and we spend our days in a kind of two-dimensional world, world skipping from one image to the next. Uh, surfing, right, that, that indicates a kind of uh, staying on the, on the surface. And we're fascinated by bodies, uh, as the Britney Spears story suggests, right, but, um, and we think of this as a kind of materialistic age, but I think that the reverse is really true. We don't so much touch bodies as look at them, and it's really pornography and not sex that characterizes our time. It's shopping and it's not having things and so on. So we don't so much cling to material things, but rather discard them and, and continue shopping. So what I want to discuss today is this kind of dynamic of uh, what Charles Taylor calls excarnation in Western culture, the, the immateriality of the world. And then I want to talk about what capitalism <coughs> nation has to offer uh, the world in this uh, circumstance. And I think what it has to offer is what Pope Francis offered Benicio Riva, a bodily embrace that seeks to share and heal the sufferings of a wounded world. And that's not just a kind of generic advocacy for making the world a better place, but a bodily encounter with those with whom Christ identifies, the hungry and the imprisoned and the sick and so on. The heart 
of Catholicism is its deep conviction that God has become incarnated. And this is the strange claim that the God of the universe has taken on human flesh in Jesus Christ, who continues to share his flesh with us, both in the form of the Eucharist and in the form of those who suffer. And this is what I think our students not only need, but want. And this is what we all find so deeply moving in these pictures. Um, so in this talk, I first want to discuss the contemporary phenomenon of excarnation and the phenomenon of incarnation. Uh, the wounds of Christ and finally some reflections about what this might mean for education, uh, Catholic education. So, uh, in thinking about what's distinctive about Catholic education, we sometimes uh, sell Catholic education on the basis of values. And, you know, we'll, we'll give your child a values-based education, not just um, facts or values and so on. And I think that's good for a first approach. Uh, but one question, of course, is which values? Right? Um, but I think even a deeper question, because values tend to be something that are kind of disembodied preferences, the deeper question in education is not just what kind of values are being taught, but what kind of formative personal encounters students will have. And to unpack that idea, I want to talk about um, uh, Canadian philosophers, uh, Charles Taylor's term, excarnation. In Taylor's famous book, uh, A Secular Age, um, Taylor's famous book, A Secular Age, is an examination of why it was nearly impossible uh, not to believe in God in the year 1500, whereas now in the West, belief in God is just one option among many. Taylor shows how meaning moved from being located out there in the world to being located in the mind. People in the medieval period thought of praying to saints as a way to affect the exterior world, to stop lightning, for instance. In the modern world, though, we tend to think of praying as something that benefits our interior life, and such changes came about not so much through the influence of science, but because of changes in Christian practice and belief. Reformers wanted to do away with a magical view of the sacraments, so the changes that sacraments affected became less in the bread and wine, for example, and more in the interior of the human person. So Taylor says, we have moved from an era in which religious life was more embodied, where the presence of the sacred could be enacted in ritual or seen or felt, touched, walked towards in pilgrimage, into one which is more in the mind, where the link with God passes more through our endorsing contested interpretation. And this movement towards excarnation is not limited to what remains of the religious sphere. The secular culture, I think, too, assumes that right action emerges from clear understanding in the mind. And so modernity has shown an unprecedented fascination with rules and norms. The more society thinks of itself as a collection of autonomous individuals, the more bureaucracies are necessary to adjudicate the tensions among individuals. Charity is depersonalized, and face-to-face -face encounters between persons are increasingly routed through government bureaucracies, for example. Social justice is what we expect the government to do, and all of this is, has something to do with what Taylor means by excarnation. And there's many more manifestations of excarnation in our society. Though we tend to think of consumerism as materialistic, it's in fact profoundly excarnated, characterized not by attachment, but by detachment from things. So consumerism is marked by what a General Motors uh, executive in an internal memo was leaked called the organized creation of dissatisfaction. So the wheels of production can only keep moving if people are constantly looking to move on to a new product. So consumerism is not so much about wanting more as it is about wanting something else. Marketing constantly presents us with new objects of desire, the effect of which is to immerse the consumer in a more or less constant state of disembodied fantasy. So consumer society is sometimes good at meeting needs and sometimes not, but what it always does well is multiply needs. So there's this constantly receding horizon of desire that's never quite arrived at. And, and this has many uh, uh, important implications in the way uh, our economy kind of distance, is, distances us from, from the material. So the products we buy or want to buy, hide their history of production 
from us. So we see the shiny tomatoes in the store, but we don't see the sweet bodies that pick them in the hot sun. We surf past glittering images of smartphones online um, that betray no hints of the teenage female bodies that assemble them. When people talk about dream houses, the phrase captures the kind of fantastical nature of our dematerialized lives. As Naomi Klein has written, brands are less disseminators of goods and services and more like collective hallucinations. So perhaps the most uh, ubiquitous manifestation of excarnation in our society is the smartphone. Electronic devices are useful, of course, and they can even connect us with people that we rarely see in person. But excarnation, I think, is an undeniable reality of the digital age. People go through the world staring at the palm of their hand, uh, which kind of detaches us from the material world. An endless parade of two-dimensional images passes before our eyes while we're distracted from the three-dimensional world that surrounds us. We shut out the sounds of the world with earbuds. Instead of looking at events with our own eyes, we look at them through our phones. And experiencing something in the flesh becomes much less important than making sure that we've recorded it and posted it on our Facebook pages. Right? Um, okay, so, um, uh, explanation. Um, as religious educators in the Catholic tradition, what do we have to offer um, this new kind of landscape? And I think what we offer is the very heart of the Catholic tradition, and that's incarnation. Catholicism is nothing more than the claim that God has taken on human flesh and that that fact changes everything. The central Christian claim is the bizarre one that God of the universe was born as a helpless baby in a barn some 2,000 years ago in an obscure village of what used to be called the Bible world. Humanity was thereby divinized. The same Athanasius said God became human so that humans could become divine. Catholics have consistently applied this principle, uh, this, this reality of incarnation, not only to humans, but the entire creation. Right? So the sacramental principle um, that's at the heart of a lot of what I do in the classroom uh, is, I think, at the heart of Catholicism. And it says that the invisible God is made present in visible, tangible form, first in the historical incarnation of Jesus Christ, and then in the sacraments that carry on that incarnation. The sacramental principle applies most acutely in the Eucharist, where we strangely eat and drink the body and blood of Christ, but also in the beauty of creation and the wonderful works of art and music and literature that have poured forth from Catholics throughout the ages. So when I teach uh, introduction to Catholicism to my pretty secularized students, I focus the course on the notion of incarnation, uh, the notion, as uh, Patrick Sherry puts it, that not only does God like matter, but he clothes himself in it. It is one of his languages. I love that quote. Not only does God like matter, but he clothes himself in it. It's one of his languages. And so we read Flannery O'Connor short stories, and we read Mary Carr's uh, often <coughs> profane poetry, and we listen to music from a mass in Kenya, and um, we you know, look at paintings by Giotto and by the Argentine painter, uh, Ricardo Sinali. Catholicism has earned the reputation of being anti-body, um, but I think nothing could really be further than from the heart of the tradition. We worship a God who became incarnate in a human body, and we now eat that body to be incorporated into that body and encounter God in the material world. Now, it would be easy enough to associate uh, or assimilate the notion of sacramentality into this kind of uh, world of images that were awash in, you know, Catholic art just got one, one more images, one more set of images that passes before our eyes. But the incarnation is not just God's way of affirming our fascination with material things. God comes in Jesus Christ not to dazzle, but to heal. God comes in Jesus Christ not to dazzle, but to heal. God takes on the afflictions of a wounded world in order to heal them. So the incarnation is not just a celebration of the material world. It's God entering into the suffering and brokenness of the physical world and offering uh, not, not an 
an escape from the physical world into fantasy, but a way of mercy that redeems and heals. So the incarnation of God is a kenosis, as Paul puts it, a self-emptying of the all-powerful God into a poor human being. So the incarnation means that God subjects God's self to the cross. Incarnation goes through suffering and death, but it doesn't end there. Of course, Christ's flesh is resurrected, and the resurrected flesh continues to be incarnated in human history. So where do we find Christ incarnate among us? Uh, the answer that Jesus gives in Matthew 25 makes it quite clear. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you made me welcome, lacking clothes and clothed and sick and visited me in prison and you came to see me. And his astonished listeners at the final judgment asked, you know, when, when did we do these things for you? And he replies, whenever you did this to the least of my brothers or sisters, you did this to me. And this is why Christ became a carpet to create a community of people who care for the bodily needs of the least among us, and on this our judgment depends. But note that in this passage, Christ does not identify himself with the good people who help others, right? Christ identifies himself with the hungry and the imprisoned and the thirsty and so on. God is incarnated in the vulnerable and the suffering the poor among us are divinized by the Incarnation. So God is not an abstract <laughs> principle. People are actually able to encounter Christ, the Incarnate God, in this world here and now in suffering flesh. And so uh, the poor are a sacrament. And this passage from Matthew is, of course, the source for the traditional Catholic practice of the works of mercy. Right. Yeah. So six of the seven corporal works of mercy are found here in Matthew 25. The seventh, to bury the dead, was a later edition. Taken as, taken as a list of the physical needs that people need to have met, the corporal works of mercy are easily secularized. Right. Everybody can see that uh, these are universal human needs. He, he refers to those in need as his brothers and sisters, not the family members of those who help. So he is not simply saying that we should help members of our own group, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan, like Christ makes clear, uh, which was just the Gospel on Sunday, right? Yes. Is it the Gospel on Sunday? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, that likewise makes, makes clear that the works of mercy cross through the boundaries. So when Jesus is asked, who is my neighbor, he respond, replies by speaking of the Samaritan who cares for a Jew, a member of a hated rival group. Now the Catholic thinker, uh, Ivan Illich, if you haven't ever read him, uh, he's very, uh, very worth reading. Um, he sees the Christian interpretation of the Good Samaritan parable as one source of the universalization of care in the Western world. So in the ancient world, your ethos, your moral action, was restricted to your ethnos, your, your ethnic group, right? You care for your, the, the people around you. But Christianity then blows that open and opens up uh, moral care to anyone in need, and that's a breakthrough in human history. But unfortunately, according to Illich, the universalization of care eventually leads to its institutionalization and its depersonalization. The practice of having a Christ room in one's home to give hospitality to strangers gradually gives way to institutionalized care. And so hospitals and asylums and schools and government programs replace person-to-person -person encounters. And he's not anti-institutional, but he wants us to focus on what's, what's kind of lost if that's all, all there is. With institutions comes the need to regularize and objectify and establish bureaucratic procedures. What, Taylor calls the fetishization of rules that typifies modernity. So morality then becomes a matter of rational principles like Kant's categorical imperative, for example, on which all are expected to agree. The whole process is what Illich calls an extraordinary history of disenfleshment of our perceptions, our concepts, and our senses. For Illich, the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan is not that the neighbor is everybody. Now, the point is that the neighbor is anybody, anybody that God throws in one's path. 
So the Samaritan responds to the wounded Jew not because of some value or principle about what he ought to do. According to the Greek text of Luke, the Samaritan was moved in his bowels. Splung necessi is the Greek word there. It's a gut reaction to help the man. The man. It's flesh calling out to flesh. And this, I think, is what we see in Pope Francis's embrace of Benicio Riva. As Illich explains, I believe, I hope, as I hope you do, in a God who is in flesh, who has, been, who has given the Samaritan as a being drowned in carnality, the possibility of creating a relationship by which an unknown chance encounter becomes for him the reason for his existence as he becomes the reason for the other survival. Not just in a physical sense, but in a deeper sense, as a human being. This is not a spiritual relationship, this is not a fantasy, this is not merely a ritual act which generates a myth, this is an act which prolongs the incarnation. Just as God became flesh and in the flesh relates to each one of us, so you are capable of relating in the flesh as one who says ego. And when he says ego, it points to an experience which is entirely sensual, incarnate, this worldly, to that other man who's been beaten up. Take away the fleshly, bodily, carnal, dense, humoral experience of self, and therefore of the thou, and the story of the Samaritan, and you have a nice liberal fantasy, which is something horrible. You have the basis on which one might feel responsible for bombing the neighbor for his own village. Right? And yeah, here I think he's thinking, you might be thinking in particular of uh, Christian ethicist Paul Ramsey, who makes an argument on the basis of the parable of the Good Samaritan, or um, that it's an act of charity, but it could also be considered an act of charity to maintain a police patrol on the road to Jericho so that this won't happen, and an army to resist external attacks on the social order that maintains the police force on the Jericho road and so on. And so you get this kind of step-by-step -step, uh, illustration of, by which one moves from the love of enemies to the justification of war. And I think kind of that's, that's what Illich has in mind here. And that excarnation is what Illich is trying to resist. The heart of the Catholic faith is the personal encounter with the incarnate God in other people, especially those who suffer. The poor, then, are not just a problem to be managed, a need towards which scarce resources are begrudgingly allocated. People who suffer are a sacrament. The primary place where the suffering God is encountered Institutions are necessary, but they cannot substitute bureaucratic modes of management for the contingent encounter of flesh with flesh. Christianity establishes contingency because it recognizes the sheer gratuity both of God's creation of the world and God's incarnate uh, incarnation in Jesus Christ. This is what people find so weird about Christianity, right? That it's so contingent. There's just one, you know, guy. 2,000 years ago in this village that, that is God. The contingent personal encounter of God in, the human, in human flesh establishes the church not so much as an institution, but what is, as Charles Taylor calls, a skein of relations which link particular, unique, and flesh people to each other. So a skein of relations rather than a, an institution. God creates the opportunity for something new and something free in human relations. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, the, the particular incarnation of Christ. There's a long tradition in the church of meditations on the five wounds of Christ, and today we tend to ignore such devotions uh, because they're kind of macabre and archaic, and uh, they seem to be a kind of relic of a morbid and self-denying world-denying spirituality that we left behind uh, before. Um, as is so often the case in Catholicism, though, once you go rummaging around in the attic, you can find uh, treasures. And um, I think these meditations on the wounds of Christ might be one uh, such example. It's not just a morbid fascination with suffering, but it's an active sense of the fecundity of the wounds, the, the, the richness, uh, of the, the productive nature of the wounds. Wounds not just as negative, as a space of absence, but as a, a tear in the fabric of the world through which grace pours. 
In the Franciscan tradition, for example, St. Clair of Assisi's Meditations on the Five Wounds speaks of the wounds as adorable, holy, and sacred, as a site from which God, quote, brings forth worthy fruits. And Julian of Norwich, too, speaks of the wound in Christ's side as, quote, a fair and delectable place, large enough for all humankind that will be saved and will rest in peace of love. So the strange image of dwelling in the wound. St. John of the Cross transposes the wounds of Christ onto the human body. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. John of the Cross's poem, Living Flame of Love, speaks of God's love as a flame that tenderly wounded my soul in its deepest center. And since the office of love is to wound, according to John of the Cross's commentary on the poem, God's love is both, both the cause of the wound and the source of its healing. He says, this wound is inflicted by the same burn that cures it, and as it is made, it is healed. And for this reason, John writes, he that is most severely wounded, or she, is most healthy. And he or she that is, most, that is altogether wounded is altogether healthy. There's a difference, of course, between the wound of violence and the wound of love. Violence seeks to inflict itself on others. Violence is a menacing presence, an attempt to make the self invulnerable and seal up every gap and fill every desire and answer every question. The wound of violence is inflicted by self-contained power. The wound of love requires a kind of self-forgetting, the transformation of the self and selfish desires into selfless love. So the wound of love is an absence, a space of hospitality to others that the self doesn't try to fill. That's what Julian of Norwich is getting at. When Christ returns from the dead, his wounds are not closed. They remain open, and he invites his disciples to probe them, to live in them. So the wound of violence is healed by the wound of love, both of which are represented in the cross of Christ. Father Richard Rohr writes, You will be wounded. Your work is to find God and grace inside the wound. This is why Jesus told Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Thomas was trying to resolve the situation mentally, as men usually do. So Jesus had to force direct physical contact with human pain, the pain of Jesus. Thomas's capacity for empathy with that pain, and very likely Thomas's own denied pain, Deep healing has to happen corporeally and emotionally, not just abstractly. Jesus wanted Thomas to face and feel in his body the tragedy of it all, and then know it was not tragedy at all. In that order, right, that is how wounds become sacred wounds. This is the pattern of all authentic conversion in the Christian economy of grace. Not around, not under, not over, but through the wound we are healed and saved. So doing the works of mercy then is not simply helping people, it's encountering Christ bodily, entering into the very wounds of Christ that mark Christ's body. James Keenan captures this sense when he defines mercy as the willingness to enter into the chaos of others. Isn't that wonderful? It's a great definition of mercy, the willingness to enter into the chaos of others so it's not helping people while remaining invulnerable. It's St. Martin of Tours entering into the shame of the nearly naked beggar by dividing his only remaining garment with the beggar and thus becoming half naked himself. It's being moved in the gut, the gut reaction, like the Samaritan, the risk getting entangled in the wounds of others to be confronted by a problem that is not yours and refuse to turn away. The works of mercy prolong the incarnation, which is nothing, nothing less than God's entering into the chaos of human life. Right? That's what incarnation is. God enters into the chaos of human life. Right? And it's not just the chaos of others. Right? It's our own chaos you know, that, that we're talking about here. And it, of course, if you enter into chaos, romanticism is one of the first casualties. I, um, uh, my journal entry from July, January 29th, 1988, I was flipping through it recently, when I was living in a slum in Santiago, Chile, begins, 
Today I have diarrhea, a zip in my ear, and fleas. <laughs> Dorothy Day was fond of quoting from the Brothers Karamazov, Love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. Uh, Margaret Garley, who is a, a Catholic worker friend of mine uh, in the U.S., once said that a very earnest woman was visiting their community and asked, does Jesus live here? And Margaret said she responded, yes, and he doesn't flush. <laughs> so, um, so to enter into the chaos of others, to allow oneself to be wounded along with others, one must, one must be able to share their pain. And Paul tells the Corinthians that all members of the body of Christ share the same nervous system. Right? If one member suffers, all suffer together with him. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. The vulnerable, then, are not to be pitied or fixed. They are part of our very body, and they are the ones we should honor most. So Paul says, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members would really need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving a greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. And both well, as first time as well. Our incorporation into the lives of the weak and the vulnerable is at the same time a wounding, sharing in the suffering and joy of others. And this is not a mere metaphor for Paul. The reason that the members share the same nervous system is that they're incorporated into the very body of Christ. And the church is the prolongation of the incarnation after the ascension of Christ. The mechanism for that incorporation is the Eucharist, the beating heart of our liturgical life. Both the church and the bread and wine are the body of Christ, the bread of the body of Christ. We become members of the body of Christ by eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. So Paul asks the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So the incarnation is prolonged by this very physical act of eating and drinking. The incorporation into the wounds of Christ is accomplished by this tearing at Christ's flesh and the drinking of his blood. Yeah, there could be no more graphic image of God's self-emptying into human form than Christ offering us his very body and blood to consume. We are then made into Christ so that we can give ourselves away. This is a, one of those wonderful uh, medieval paintings of Jesus kind of tearing a host out of his body to, to offer, collecting <coughs> his own blood in a, in a chalice. So we're then made into Christ so that we can give ourselves away, offering ourselves to become bread for the world. So like ordinary food that becomes assimilated to our bodies, we are turned into Christ. So we eat Christ, Christ eats us, and then we're devoured by the world. Um, uh, this wonderful way of, kind of turning the act of consumption inside out. Now, if that doesn't appeal to a generation of students who love zombie movies, <laughs> I mean, you know, and I'm really serious about, I should say dead serious, I suppose I'm really <laughs> serious about that. Um, there's all sorts of theories about how and why zombies and vampires are so uh, popular today, um, especially in literature and TV and so on, and young adults. But my theory is that young people are starved for the Eucharist, right? They want to sink their teeth into, into bodies. Um, the excarnation of Western culture has advanced to such an extent that people are dying for bodies they can sink their teeth into. There's only so much virtual reality that somebody can take before they need some body and blood, right? And that is what we have to offer the, the Eucharist. I'm suggesting that the Catholic tradition has gifts to offer an excarnated world in desperate need of connection and healing. Incarnation is the very heart of our tradition and what the world needs and longs for. Incarnation, furthermore, bridges two parts of Catholic education that sometimes we don't connect very well. Right? We take students to Mass 
and we do service projects and teach doctrine, but the relationships among them are not always clear. In the worst cases, we bifurcate service and doctrine, right? And either we do <coughs> service as an afterthought to the real thing, which is doctrine, or, uh, or doctrine or liturgy, or more commonly these days, we're slightly embarrassed by doctrine and liturgy, so we reduce the Catholic tradition to vaguely humanistic goals in helping people and lobbying for legislation. And we sometimes feel that students and often their parents are turned off by doctrines about God and by the Mass, so we sell Catholic education on the basis of service projects and social justice concerns that we think everyone can share. But if we do this, I don't think we can be too surprised that our students don't come back to church as adults. Right? If there's lots of opportunities out there for generic service projects and social justice concern, you know, why, why would you put up with all the other Catholic stuff, right? all the other baggage? Right? So when we separate service and social justice on the one hand from liturgy and doctrine on the other, so I think we miss an opportunity to give students what they really want and need, which is incarnation, and not just incarnation of the lowercase i, but incarnation with a capital i, but the, the incarnation. Pope Francis has talked about this recently. He said, we can, all, we can do all the social work we want, and they will say, how oh, nice the church, what good social work the church does. But if we say that we do this because those people are the flesh of Christ, they're scandal. Right? Those people are the flesh of Christ. And that is the truth. That's the truth. That's the revelation of Jesus, the presence of Jesus incarnate. So it makes all the difference in the world if service and social justice projects run students face to face, not simply with those who are less fortunate than us, but with Jesus Christ. Catholicism divinized, divinizes the poor, their sacraments. So crucially, too, they do not remain they, but they are us, right? The whole point is breaking down this boundary between them, them and us. We're all members of the same body, sharing the same nervous system, and that body is Christ's very body. Um, and we need to, I think, take that seriously, it's not just a, a metaphor. To enter into the chaos of another's life is to feel the pain viscerally. And students should be trained in the sense that we're all linked. All of our lives are densely intertwined. All of us, poor and not poor, disabled and temporarily able. We all have our own chaos to share. We've all got our own chaos to share. And our only hope is that all this chaos is taken up and healed in the body of Christ. If students search the face of the other for the face of Christ, how they think and act in the world, I think, will be transformed. Doctrine and liturgy are likewise transformed if they're not simply exercises in abstract concepts or overly rationalized symbolic acts. The doctrine of the Incarnation is the gateway to the doctrines of Trinity, of Holy Spirit, of Anthropology, Church, Sin, Salvation, Sacrament, Liturgy, and so on. If we give students experiences of incarnation, if they feel it in their gut, then the rest of the teachings of the church might begin to make sense and seem relevant to their lives. If they experience the reality of the invisible God manifesting God's self in the material world, if they encounter Jesus Christ in the wounds of the world, then they might be ready to discover who made the world, what's wrong with it, how God heals it, right, creation, uh, redemption, the whole history of salvation, in other words. We have no reason to be shy about what we believe. We need to give students the fullness of the doctrine of the Eucharist. I think all, all the time with Flannery O'Connor's quip about the Eucharist, if it's a symbol to help with it, right? It's not merely a symbol. We eat Christ's body and drink his blood. Students who have already encountered Christ's wounds in the world might find this blood and guts compelling. In the context of a school or a parish, the face-to-face -face contact with the corporal works of mercy might be infrequent, but there's many other ways of practicing incarnation in the context of religious education, learning in the classroom about people who suffer, uh, seeing images of real people, pilgrimages and liturgies that require students to use their bodies, creating a community of mercy in the school that gives students a sense of sharing the same nervous system, exposing students to the rich tradition of Catholic art and music, 
and architecture and drama and poetry and novels. Uh, and indeed, I make a plea for seeing education as a spiritual work of mercy and for seeing the unity of the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. Right? Instructing the ignorant and counseling the doubtful are traditionally the first two spiritual works of mercy. And that, I think, describes what Catholic educators do in part in a way. Although the spiritual works of mercy do not have the scriptural pedigree of the corporal works of mercy, the list of spiritual works was devised as a complement to the list of corporal works of mercy that you find in Matthew 25 in order to make sure that the soul and the body are both fed. So, um, <coughs> doctrine and service are inseparable. Another way of saying this is that the spiritual and the corporal works of mercy are inseparable. The way to overcome excarnation is not simply to emphasize the body, but to, but to unite the body and the spirit. The corporal works are essential to developing the spiritual virtues of faith and hope and love. And one who has had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ in the wounds of another or their own wounds is free of the kind of doubt that merely logical arguments about the existence of God rarely heal. Right? You need an encounter with God. At the same time, the spiritual works are essential to the practice of the corporal works because the spiritual works train us to be ready to see the sufferings of others and be willing to enter into their chaos. The failings of the priest and the Levite who passed by the wounded man on the Jericho road were failings in their training. They had not been educated to be ready for the distressed man who was thrown into the path. So I want to conclude by um, just talking about a couple of the ways that I try to practice incarnation in my classes. At DePaul University, I teach a class for incoming freshmen called Global Catholicism and Story in Stone. And the class tells the story of immigrant Catholicism in Chicago. So in addition to traditional classroom work, we do site visits to a Polish Catholic Church, an Irish Catholic Church, and a Mexican Catholic Church, and a Chinese Catholic Church, and a, Mexican, a, a German Catholic Church, and an African American Catholic Church, and so on. So students learn about the lives of Catholic immigrants uh, that revolved, and in some cases still do, around their parishes and how working people saved their pennies to build magnificent houses of worship. Churches were usually the only beautiful place that poor people were allowed into, and so they celebrated God in beauty. This is Holy Trinity uh, in Chicago, a Polish mission church. And when the students walk in every year, you can literally hear them gasp as they enter. Mostly secularized students, but my course is often the last one that's open. But they end up loving it, right? How can you not? You come in and you're just immersed in this beauty, and, and the students find it very, very moving. Uh, at St. Stanislaus, which is another Polish uh, Baroque church just down the street from Mother Trinity, uh, after seeing the beautiful art, uh, we go downstairs and we see the coal chute uh, and the safe from when they had a, a credit union there. And the coal chute is from you know, where people used to come and gather their coal. That was the, the kind of central place. So the Blessed Sacrament and coal and cherubim and credit, the students begin to see how God permeated every aspect of people's lives, how Catholicism is a matter of both the body and the soul together. And that's not just a history lesson. We meet with Michael Flager, we go down to uh, St. Sabinus and meet with Michael Flager, who's kind of a famous uh, figure. Uh, he just, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Spike Lee movie, Shirak, but um, the priest is modeled after Michael Flager. Um, but he has done violence in his, neighbor's, in his neighborhood under the watchful eye of an African uh, Jesus, uh, this wonderful painting that stands beside the altar. It's an old Gothic church that was built by Germans back in the 1910s, I think. Um, but it, it's been filled with um, African American art. We go to Our Lady of Guadalupe, we go to St. Pius V uh, Church, and we meet with lay people who counsel domestic violence victims under the patronage of Our Lady of Guadalupe. They've actually got five full time staff working with nothing but domestic violence. 
at this parish. Um, and these are some of the murals that are around the Mexican neighborhood here. Here you see um, Our Lady of Guadalupe looking over the um, migrants who are coming across the river uh, from Mexico uh, into, the, into the United States. So the physical act of walking in so-called bad neighborhoods, right? We take, we take these mostly kind of middle-class kids and we take them into what they think are bad neighborhoods uh, in Chicago. And just that physical act of walking in there, of personally encountering beautiful art and beautiful people uh, or just going about their everyday business and not shooting each other, right? It gives the students this kind of indelible experience of the incarnation. And our trips um, in, around the city on public transportation, you know, cell phone use is strictly forbidden, right? Students can take their phones out only at designated times. And in my class, I have another class on Catholicism and consumerism, and we go beyond that. Uh, students are invited to participate in a three-week exercise in asceticism. And what this means, usually about half the class does it. I don't force anybody to do it. But usually about half the class does it um, just voluntarily because they find the, uh, the idea so bizarre. Um, you know, try. But um, we give up cell phones, uh, computers, television, earbuds, meat, sugar, caffeine, alcohol, artificial ingredients of any kind, tobacco, sex, um, etc., uh, for three weeks. Uh, and every day they need to uh, pray for an hour and uh, do a daily act of charity, practice modified silence on certain days. And those students that make it all the way through right, find this experience tremendously uh, transformative. Um, it's something that, again, gets, gets under their skin. Saying why it's so powerful to them exactly is difficult. Um, I try to emphasize that asceticism is not a negative thing. It's not anti-body or anti-material. On the contrary, it's a way of resisting excarnation because it reduces distractions and it returns the body to the basics of physical life on Earth. You know, one student, for example, told me that uh, she hadn't heard birds chirp since she was a little kid because she walks around with earbuds all the time. This was a, that kind of uh, transformative experience. Asceticism comes from a Greek word that originally referred to the kind of training that athletes do for the Olympics or so on. One renounces goods like chocolate donuts in order to be able to run a marathon. And students are likewise encouraged in the spiritual life to clear away distractions from what's most deeply satisfying. And so in the context of the class, students are encouraged to use the exercise as a break from having their desires manipulated by marketing and so on, and as a way of feeling in their own bodies the kinds of limits of consumption that poor people have to face daily. And this experience of asceticism is the single most effective exercise that do in my teaching. It's visceral, it's incarnate, it evokes solidarity, it evokes healing. It's an experience of kenosis, of the self-emptying that God made effective in the incarnation, and it clears the way for encounters with God uh, and with other people. Um, so those are some examples from my own context. Your context, of course, will be different. But what I hope to have illustrated is something of what Pope Francis has encouraged us to do, to take as our focal point the incarnation of God in our wounded world and to bring our students to the beauty and the healing that Christ brings. Thank you.